And I would uh, invite all of you to join me in welcoming uh, our special guest this evening as the R. Wayne Craft and Joan Craft Memorial Lecture, Dr. Michael Root. My presentation tonight will be in two halves. First, I want to say something about the history of the Catholic reaction to Luther over the last 500 years. And then I want to say a few things about, I think, a more adequate approach to, to, to Luther from a Catholic perspective today. Now, a significant question, a sort of what if that historians debate, is whether Luther's theology implied from the start a radical criticism of Catholic structures of authority, a criticism that would have come to the surface sooner or later anyway, that, the, that so to speak, it was already set up for a head-on collision, or was it the case that Luther was radicalized by his critics, forced by the debate into a far more radical position than was implicit, in fact, in his early teachings. It wasn't, it isn't help that in fact the Catholic opponents of Luther were making claims for papal authority far beyond contemporary papal teachings. Sylvester Priorius, the master of the papal palace, said that the Pope stands above scripture. The Pope is not under scripture, but it's, although it's, a, it's authoritative interpreter, rather the Pope stands above scripture, something no contemporary Catholic theologian would contend. I would add that almost all contemporary commentators on this debate agree that with one exception, Cardinal Cajetan, major theologian who interviewed Luther late 1518, in fact, almost all of the theologians who attacked Luther, who engaged him on the Catholic side, um, simply weren't very good. Uh, these were ham and eggers. Uh, this is, you're sending Mike Trout and Bryce Harper, and we're bringing up uh, the Harrisburg senator pitching staff uh, to throw to them. Uh, it's just the case that the Catholic theologians engaged in the first 20 years of the debate with Luther simply aren't very good. It's not till you get the 1540s, say, 1550s, that you start getting really, I would say, serious kinds of response. Um, all of this fed Luther's view that his opponents were knaves or fools or in most cases, both. Already by the time of Pius X, in the early 20th century, different views of Luther were developing. In 1905 to 1907, the great medievalist, Heinrich de Niefle, published a large study, a two-volume study of Luther. In many ways, de Niefle still gives a quite negative judgment of Luther. A difference was he had actually read Luther read large amounts of Luther. He even went hunting for manuscripts that had never been published. Um, it sounds odd, but one of the most important discoveries in the 20th century was an early set of lectures Luther gave in 1515 to 16, just before the 95 Theses, on Paul's letter to the Romans. De Niefle found the original copy in the Vatican archives of all places, probably in the Thirty Years' War, some Catholic army raided a Protestant library and took them off, uh, and they ended up in the Vatican archives. Um, de Niefle did judge Luther negatively. He tended to judge Luther by the standards of scholastic theology and thought he was simply incompetent. He was a halbwisser, a half-knower. He only half understood theology. De Niefle's interpretation centered on Luther as a monk tortured by scruples, who instead of following the church's traditional methods of dealing with scruples, instead reinterpreted the faith in order to make his scruples not matter. That it's all a function of Luther's scrupulous psychology expressing itself in bad theology. I don't think that reading actually has much basis in the texts, but I still run into it with great regularity in Catholic circles, that Luther was scrupulous, sort of standard problem of Catholic piety, and that he solved his scrupulosity by reinterpreting the faith, so his feeling that he wasn't truly doing good works didn't matter, so to speak. Um, the great change in the Catholic reading of Luther came in the mid-20th century, uh, and in the development of a genuine 
Catholic School of Luther interpretation in Germany. The great name, as I mentioned earlier, was Joseph Lortz, professor uh, in Germany. His 1930s book, The Reformation in Germany, is really the first book of Catholic Reformation study that stands really close scholarly reading. Now, Lortz's reading of Luther is more sympathetic, but in some ways still negative. What Lortz does is take Luther and put him into a kind of larger historical narrative. For Lortz, the late Middle Ages, 150 or 200 years before Luther, is a history of decline. The great 13th century figures, Aquinas and Bonaventure, were followed by an increasingly obscure fascination with logic in people like John Duns Scotus, and a descent into a thinly veiled uh, Pelagianism in people like William of Ockham, Gabriel Beale, and others. The trouble was, Luther was schooled in the Via Moderna. He was schooled in this nominalist theology, fascinated with complex logic, unconnected to life, utterly Pelagian. And thus, Luther didn't reject true Catholicism because he had never been taught true Catholicism. What he rejected, Lortz argued, was a degenerate form of late medieval Christianity that wasn't truly Catholic to start with. Luther made an attempt to move the faith back closer to evangelical truth, although partially because he never was able to throw off all of the bad things he was taught, his position still remained in some deeply sense, uh, deep sense, um, unacceptable. Now, the first thing I think to be said is you have to untangle Luther, if you're going to assess Luther, from other things he's bound up with. Um, I think we must distinguish an assessment of Luther from an assessment of the Reformation. The Reformation is a complex event, uh, and it cannot be reduced simply to theology. Uh, the Reformation uh, was embedded in church political developments. I think it's necessary to draw some distinctions between Luther the theologian and Luther the man. And here I want to be critical of the Catholic tendency, I think following Denifla, to sort of read Luther's theology in terms of his psychology. Uh, I'm suspicious of doing that. Now, it, you can't entirely separate Luther's theology from Luther the man, um, but I, I'm against a psychological reduction of his theology. As a human being, Luther is at best complex, and there are certain aspects of him that are deeply problematic. His polemics, most notably his infamous text on the Jews and their lies, and in his very extreme polemics at the end of his life against the papacy, genuinely suggests some level of personal Im imbalance. But the task of the theologian, I think, is to engage Luther's theology, the way he interprets the Christian faith and the Christian life. Now, I think any Catholic engagement with Luther's theology must be complex. As I've said, his writings are voluminous. He did not care very much about consistency. Um, there are aspects of his text that a Catholic can embrace. But also at times, I think a Catholic inevitably will find deep and fundamental problems in Luther's theology. For better or worse, and almost surely for both better and worse, Martin Luther was one of the greatest minds to have ever done Christian theology. In his own way, he is a giant of the faith. Catholic theology has wrestled with Luther for over 500 years. I think Catholic theology today is much closer to a clear-eyed assessment of Luther than ever before. There are things to appreciate, but also aspects of his outlook that finally are, I think, incompatible with deep commitments that have rightly shaped Catholic belief and practice. In the end, however, I think Luther is one of those figures like Augustine or Aquinas with whom our assessment is never done. The argument with Luther, I think, will be endless. He is always a challenging figure, and Catholic theology can only profit by taking up the challenge. Thank you.